Uh, thank you, Chris, very much. Um, hello, it's uh, great to sort of be with you uh, this evening, although I really do wish I was in Exeter. Um, but thank you, and uh, and let's see where this goes. I'm, I've, I've written down a few thoughts, and um, I'm not quite sure what I make of them, never mind what you'll make of them, but let, let's see what happens. Um, there was a Victorian bishop who uh, I think came from around your way, actually, who left um, a very unusual will. It was very short and he'd written it in verse. And he asked that it be read out to all of his clergy on his death. It said, tell my priests when I am gone, O me to shed no tears, for I shall be no deader then than they have been for years. And I'm a little bit worried, if I'm honest, that you may feel that I'm one of those clergy this evening, uh, because I want to briefly uh, talk about some difficult things, and I might come across, I suspect, as a bit of an Eeyore rather than a Tigger. But I'm going to do it in case any of it resonates. And I'm also doing it because I think people who are interested in Christian faith should always be interested in truth. And that means never being tempted to make honest complexity into something dishonestly simple. We, all of us, I suspect, wish that life came with subtitles, but it doesn't. And sometimes people in the church can talk about truth a lot, but then find it really difficult to be honest. So the title of my talk refers to a Seamus Heaney poem. Uh, the poem is called The Loose Box. And it's a poem in which Seamus Heaney recalls himself as a child going into church to see the Christmas crib, but being disappointed with the painted lifeless figures in the stable. It was, he says, nothing but gloss and chill. And as he kneels at the altar rail, he continues, I knelt and learnt almost not to admit the letdown to myself. What I want to do, I suppose, uh, in these few minutes together is a sort of quick spiritual stock take of where we are at the moment. The state of our faith, the state of our doubt, our inner life, and perhaps where we think the church is in all this at the moment. Because I suspect, and I'm speaking primarily for myself, uh, the church at the moment can, in those heeny words, appear to be nothing but gloss and chill. We've all been wearing masks, and I suppose I'm asking, have they started to eat into our faces? We've been in self-isolation. Are we hiding some feelings? Have some feelings uh, been imprisoned? Uh, do we know what to do with the feelings that have been generated over the last 18 months or so. This self-scrutiny might be important as we slowly emerge, we hope, although we don't know, from such an extraordinary time of pandemic. And clinging to everything, it seems, are some pretty deep and often dark feelings in the air. Some of them uh, we are acquainted with, but others are pushed firmly out of view and sometimes we hardly know they're there until of course they emerge and surprise us and remind us that uh, we've repressed things. So those unpredictable uh, things that happen in life, you know, the way you suddenly speak to your partner when it's the last thing you ever want to do is hurt them, the sharpness of your reactions to people, um, the dullness of your response to other people, the lack of new thinking when you sit at the laptop, the demise of motivation, the heaviness, the silence you've often descended to in company or in prayer, or for some people in that chest pained anxiety before the meeting. And for many of us, um, 
and, and this is a real problem, or it has been over the last months, apparently, uh, those book reading or pillow wrestling uh, 3 a.m.s where none of us can sleep properly. And now, forgive me if none of that is you, and I'm really pleased it isn't, but I do suspect, and I've heard it from quite a few people and have read about it too, this is how many of us have been uh, living in our inner selves over the last months. For some, of course, it's been much more intense than others, depending on the suffering that uh, life may have had. And I wonder if you'd allow me just to be personal for a few moments, but about two months ago, it was pretty difficult for me because, um, uh, to put it in context, I was brought up by my grandparents and my grandmother is still alive. She is 99. Uh, she's managed up till now to live in her own home uh, with my auntie and uncle and me taking turns on a rota to be with her to cook and clean and help her walk to the loo and all that. And I guess many of you here have been in very similar places. And all through her life, she's said to me, never put me in one of those homes. I can't stand the thought of all those old people. But of course, it became obvious that as family, we're now well beyond our capabilities. Um, and we had to be open with her that uh, we feel she needs more than we can give now. And she would be better looked after with some nursing assistance and a care home. And she's a war generation woman, um, so she reflected head on and accepted it. And although I could see behind her eyes, she was a bit worried uh, and felt out of control, I think. Um, scared she was going to lose touch with the neighbours and those who matter most. Uh, she didn't complain and she didn't make our lives difficult over it. So I managed to help her into my car and I drove the 20 minutes to introduce her to this new home, uh, a room of her own, but a bit soulless, a bit hotel-like. And as we drove away from her house um, to get there, we both knew I think she wouldn't ever see it again. And I kept resolute through the day somehow. I fussed around a lot and uh, made sure she was okay and the staff were friendly and I ensured her FaceTime worked and that her clothes were put away and she knew how to use the TV remote and all those things. And she was very sleepy and exhausted, I think. Uh, after a hectic day, she looked very frail and vulnerable and she was a bit confused. And I kissed her goodbye and she just said, oh, I love you. So I went back to her house <clears throat> and it took, I think, about five hours for my tears to eventually come. Um, and when they did, boy, did they come. Um, I thought I'd done the right thing, but I just felt so guilty about it. Uh, there seemed to be no alternative and no going back. I was in her empty house and the presence of it just seemed to have gone. Uh, and I could only see in my mind that sort of aloneness and precariousness uh, and her telling me she still loved me. Now, I don't want to be over dramatic about all this, but biblically, those tears are known as a lament. Lament. Listen to those two long syllables that slow down every sentence uh, and every life lament. And a lament is the language for disorientation. In my case that night, it was the body language. But a lament, uh, the dictionaries will tell us, is a passionate expression of sorrow, grief or regret, uh, maybe complaint, anger at how life is that causes us such hurt. But the themes of that period two months ago for me are really becoming clearer. So there was that relocation that caused dislocation. There was a sense of an ending, but with no immediate sense of what's beginning. There was an inevitability that cut into the heart. 
There was a sense of things taken for granted, which now were fragile. There was a sense of not being prepared for the later loss that will come. Um, and it still, I suppose, all feels hugely significant and yet beyond me. I know it's an important time, but although I'm going through it, I don't really feel I'm experiencing it. I can't yet, as it were, experience the experience. I'm just able to sort of look at it all and after a deep breath, shape it into a talk for some people in Devon who I think might understand. So my nan seems to be settling, but I haven't felt so unsettled for quite a long time. Now the comparison, the reason I'm telling you all this, the comparison to that with our position at the moment um, might be evident to some. Um, in an increasingly, I think, precarious church, in a nation and in a world so affected by disease, by isolation, by bereavement, livelihoods collapsing, blame being sought, um, that dislocation, things being lost uh, where we can't quite see where it's all leading, um, what our home life as a church or as a citizen so to speak, will look like. What's expected of us in this time of provisionality and rethink that everybody's having to engage with? How in all this do you stay in touch with yourself? How do you stay in touch with the public arena? And how do you stay in touch with your God? Uh, it's also been a time, of course, where we've seen a lot of beauty and a lot of sacrifice as well. And it seems that there are a lot of good changes that have and are taking place through all this, although it's a little bit too soon to tell. But all these themes, it seems to me, are lodged very deep in many of our hearts and psyches at the moment, where people who've become very acquainted with what Thomas Hardy referred to as the wonder and the wormwood of the whole. And the global suffering and havoc. So you only need to think of the pictures we've been watching from the queen herself in her lonely pew, sitting by herself, to nurses holding phones so that somebody can gasp their last goodbyes to, to their loved ones, to people in India, running around looking for oxygen, all these pictures which have been seeping in day after day. Uh, what, what is all this doing to us? Is it summoning any new ways of understanding or seeing? And the word that, that's come to mind through all this period is dismantling. Uh, so many things at the moment seem to be dismantling. Uh, and you could start with our planet itself, you know, our environment. Um, you could look at liberal democracy, or you could look at an agreed understanding of truth and accuracy, um, which all seem to go during, during the Trump period, uh, but also across many other parts of the world. Um, values based on universal, equal human dignity. So many of these things which we took for granted in many ways are before our eyes dismantling. Uh, ordinary life as we've known it has been dismantled. So COVID dismantled my own heart muscles uh, for a while. It then killed my partner's father and another two million people around the world. How many bereaved parents and partners and children that leaves is unknown. But even the way we were not able to mourn and bury loved ones was dismantled. So what I'm saying, I think, and you can see why I warned you about sounding like Eeyore, 
is that I, I do think that we can feel things have dismantled, but we can't quite see if I have any place in what's emerging because I can't quite see what it's all adding up to. And I can't quite see if I'm a person of faith where God is at work in all this. Um, I suppose the question is, are things just falling apart or are some important things just painfully falling into place? Uh, whatever uh, uh, your conclusion is with that question, there is a sense in which it can feel like spiritual exile. And that's why it was great to hear Psalm 137, which is, of course, uh, a poem that comes out of exactly that experience of exile. Uh, lament is uh, the song that exile will often sing. And I remember, um, so I'd put my nan into this home and, and I've been watching the news just like you have been. And on Easter day, uh, I heard the gospel and I heard that question in John's gospel, you know, why are you weeping? And I thought, well, frankly, where are we going to begin with that? Um, and all this slightly solemn <laughs> introduction of mine is to say this, that the question, why are you weeping, is a profoundly important one. If we let it scrutinize us very seriously, it reveals us to ourselves. And, and this is why I think it's in the resurrection narrative, it's only that question on which any resurrection can be founded and then lived out. Um, just a couple of, of thoughts too about um, lament. Um, lament, I think, is a spiritual discipline. Uh, biblically, and again, I, we've just heard one of the Psalms, but about a third of the Psalms um, have lament in it. Um, it is a formal, structured expression of sorrow and complaint or mourning. Uh, so, I don't know, Psalm 13, for instance, will you forget me forever, God? How long are you going to hide? Uh, how long must I wrestle with my thoughts day after day with sorrow? How long will the enemy triumph over me? And you find in these Psalms, which of course is uh, always cited as being the most popular book of, of the Bible for many people. Um, complaints, uh, lots of complaints. Uh, the psalmist sometimes complaining that, you know, his or her body's not working too well, got disease or disappointment or depression. Bad people are doing rather better than, than they are, uh, and so on. And then you can lament about God uh, in the Psalms. You know, he's either unresponsive or he's just acting peculiarly. You know, uh, the odd has come back into God. Uh, and Jesus knew and prayed all these Psalms of lament. Uh, he even recites to, we're told on the cross, to a God who seems to have deserted him and yet into whose hands he commends himself. And um, again, I mean, we could go on and on, but you know, Hebrews tells us that Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears. And I'm afraid that church liturgies can be so sanitized that we have forgotten this discipline of lament and, and complaint um, a recent study, for instance, of um, contemporary hymnals concluded that only about 4% of hymns reflect that kind of lament that's modelled in the Psalms. So our own Psalms, as it were, our own poems that we sing, have forgotten this discipline and tradition. And the serious issue there is that it renders the sufferer voiceless or it limits the sufferer into saying things they don't really want to. So um, what we need in the church, it seems to me quite often, particularly in our liturgies, is, if I can put it this way, 
a little more barefaced integrity. And I mention the church and I put it into the title of my talk uh, because it's so central to who I am and who I've been and how I think and presumably who I will yet be. And the church for which I'm so grateful and of which I'm a part uh, and in which I've tried to live a ministry of sorts, uh, this church at the moment seems to be um, and please come back at me later if if this is just unfair or not not anything you recognize. But for me, it does seem to be a thin, um, somewhat half-hearted, defensive church um, institutionally, but also in many local areas. Uh, so uncertain about things it should be certain of and uh, very certain about things that don't really matter a great deal. Um, I'm really trying not to be a grumbling old bugger here, but I, I, I do try to be an encourager because it's more in my blood. But I, I am lamenting the institutional church's place in the public arena having almost disappeared. Um, I'm lamenting its ability to engage the public imagination. Um, I think I'm lamenting its ability, lack of ability to partner up with those who have no faith in parish or diocese or nation. It just seems to be a little less imaginative and a little less plausible. But as I say, um, I may be just a bit jaundiced and um, you have right of reply later. Um, I put myself forward for ordination, I think, because I wanted to engage with the most important things in life. I didn't ever want to be part of some politely irrelevant setup. Uh, but the internal life, and in some cases, leadership of the church can just feel a bit overly cautious and therefore compromised and a bit superficial. And sometimes the language of the institutional church can just feel like we're part of a sort of spiritual building society or a corporate endeavour. Um, I don't, by the way, think that the stripping of the church's power, its sense of entitlement or unaccountable behaviour is a bad thing. Of course I don't. I think being brought back to size uh, might be about time. But if that is the case, what we have left must be good, must be full of faith and love, and it must be attractive. And um, I often think of Gandhi, uh, who talked about the evangelism of the rose. It's, it's the rose's beauty and its attractiveness that draws people closer to it. What it is, is what it does best. It just is and by being it attracts people to come closer to it that sort of evangelism is what i'm longing for at the moment rather than endless initiatives uh, with a language that doesn't resonate with many people at all so my final comments are just to go back to this lament theme i think we need to learn to pray through lament uh, because several things happen if you do that. First, you express the feelings and experience of suffering or complaint, and therefore you begin to restore some order in the midst of chaos. Just by saying it helps to restore order. Secondly, it allows that suffering to be expressed interpersonally. So you bring it into relationship with God and maybe with one another. You don't just keep it to yourself. Praying lament addresses God, your hurts brought before God. It doesn't just stagnate in you. Uh, and thirdly, it helps us as we struggle for the words to hear ourselves, to excavate these feelings that are lying very deep behind our social selves. 
um, unseen forces that are controlling us quite often from day to day. Um, and I do think that, and, and Walter Brueggemann, who's a, a theologian who often talks about lament, what he often said is language doesn't just follow reality, it creates it. So, you know, if you speak things, it, it calls forth a new reality. Uh, he called it a, a subversion of reality. It's a Christian people, when they're talking often about the kingdom, are talking about that version of reality that's lying beneath what people think is reality. He called it the subversion. And in order to get there, you have to subvert. So it means that as we give voice, nothing should be off limits. Confusion, emotional chaos, uh, or pain. The only way out of this is through it, not around it. Uh, and that means that we have to, as a, as a community of companions, uh, find a way of expressing it together sometimes. And I found myself drawn over this Lent um, that's just, just gone, um, reading a lot about St. Benedict <clears throat> and the Benedictine rule of life and tradition. Um, I joined in every evening online with an Irish monastery for, for Compline. And I thought at the time that it was probably uh, the stress on stability that, that Benedict has that was drawing me in this time of, of chaos. <clears throat> I thought it might be the silence or the, the community that was just so um, appealing. But I do now realize, I think it was the continual use of the Psalms that daily lament and voicing that they were allowing me, rhythms of conversion and reconversion that they were instilling and warnings against any false peace or quick clarity and the dangers of wanting to be spiritual too quickly. Uh, I think we might need a few Benedicts in the church uh, and probably a few Francis's as well over the next few years. So to end, it was Ronald Knox who once said that uh, when uh, somebody once said to Ronald Knox, uh, uh, pull yourself together, his response was, I'm not sure I have it together. And I think this is where many of us are feeling at the moment. It will mean a belief in silence. It will need resisting a control takeover of the situation. It will need a lot of inner honesty and scrutiny, not platitudes, not churchy cliches, not bumper sticker theology. It will require some lament, a gift of tears that washes your eyes out to see the truth better. If you go to hell, says the old Middle Eastern saying, just make sure you don't come back empty handed. Rowan Williams has said that vocation has to do with saving your soul, not by acquiring a secure position of holiness, but by learning to shed the unreality that suffocates the life of the soul. Vocation is, you could say, what's left when all the games have stopped. Well, lament finally in the in the scriptures is not just a complaint the purpose of lament ultimately in the bible is to lead to praise again lament leads into praise i do believe that many games have stopped over the last 18 months uh, others as i say it feels are somewhat coming to an end something's in the air this could be the perfect time to relearn our vocation as Christians, but also please God as a church. And the two questions I, I wondered whether you'd like to spend a bit of time with. The first question is, what effect do you think the pandemic has really had on you?
even if it hasn't affected you personally, just day by day, watching these numbers, watching how many people are being vaccinated, watching, reading all this news about it, day by day by day, being maybe locked away, unable to see people you love, all that. What's all this, what effect has it had on you? What's been bad and what's been good? That's the first question. And the second is about the church. Is the church an easy place to be honest in? And you could think about generally, uh, but if you're part of a, of a local church, you could, you could think about your own local church uh, or cathedral. Is it an easy place to be honest in? If not, why not? And if it is, how can you encourage more of it? There we are. Um, I, I can't wait to get back to singing, but um, I must say that I, it would be interesting to know whether it's the singing or the words that are being sung that um, that's most attractive. <laughs> uh, I just, uh, yeah, sometimes we don't even, we, we go on autopilot and we don't really know what we're singing half the time. Uh, and sometimes, of course, our theology is done most through what we're singing and when I went recently to preach to a, a clergy retirement home with some very elderly clergy who've, you know, served the church through decades, what I was profoundly moved by in the service was that under their masks, the, the bit they most engaged is when they, they recognised the hymn tune and the words they knew. And that's where they began to to voice their faith again. Uh, so yes, I I have a high doctrine of hymns, but um, I do wish sometimes, particularly contemporary ones, were a little more able to voice our our inner life. Mark, thank you. Um, Claire asks about the um, idea of ambiguous loss when a person might be. Um, physically gone but psychologically present missing in action or the opposite way around for example with um, Alzheimer's um, and she asks how you um, think this might help us to respond to Covid and the dismantling and the let let down the idea of ambiguous loss. Is she is the person asking the question here? Could, could yes, I? Yes I am. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Hi, could you just could you just help me a bit more? Just just unravel that question a bit. Oh golly, um, uh, uh, I'm not sure. Um, it came from a podcast I was listening to. Uh huh. Um, so yeah, I suppose in COVID, if we, I mean, we are maybe, I, I hope, psychologically present right now, but we are physically distanced. And um, because of that, uh, not able necessarily to experience fully this service together and your talks and being able to discuss together. Um, and it's it's like a microcosm of so many things that have been happening during mm. lockdown, during the pandemic. Mm. Mm. Well, certainly, I mean, if this slightly circles around your question, I think one of the things I've really come to believe in <laughs> with renewed belief is that the Christian faith is incarnational. It is about bodies and presence of bodies and uh you know as i was saying at christmas with you know lots of eyes going up you know there's no zoom in the inn uh, <laughs> that actually it's about human interaction and um it's not enough to do what we're doing now i think it's great it's been in so many ways uh a lifeline it's kept us all together, but it's not enough. I, I believe that uh, 
we have bodies for a purpose and i actually believe in body language i i always say jesus is the body language of god um, in a body and um i think that we have we felt that very much i think and so many of the painful stories have been about the distance between bodies isn't it you know touching through glass and uh, not being able to hug all those sort of things which we we've come to see again and appreciate just how important the fact that we are like we are it is it is just so vital to our well-being and purpose but my goodness me it's come at a cost it seems to me um, i want to think i mean i i've just been able to read what you've what you've written there and i'd i'd like to think a little bit more about all that i may come back to it at the end thank you somebody asks if um we come back from hell with something in our hands what have been some of the things for you and what have you seen other people bring back yeah so if you go to hell don't come back empty-handed uh, for me, um, well, there's that that I've just mentioned, an appreciation that human beings are, are bodies as well as souls, an appreciation of nature more. Um, I was a Shropshire boy <laughs> by birth, you know, Shropshire born, Shropshire bred, strong in the body, thick in the head, as they say. Uh, and I, as a young boy, I was uh, animated by my countryside surroundings and then I became a sort of city student and a city priest and and I must say that I mean Cambridge is hardly you know the, the rural wilds but having a garden now and being able to appreciate the cycles of nature and the uh, closeness and just to be reminded that there we share this earth with other life forms uh, has been a wonderful thing to rediscover for me um and the, and i suppose the other thing that's uh, really struck me is how important friendship is um and i don't mean the 700 you know we've got on facebook i mean the the three or four people who make your life survivable just because and we go back to the same theme because with them you can share your loose ends um I, i've seen i think that again and i'm very grateful for the for the close friends i've got and um, i think a lot of people have also seen that too um paul asks and you probably can't see this because he sent it to me but he asks you talked about stripping away in two ways i mean firstly about stripping away the power and entitlement of the church but also at the end about stripping away down to our, our real vacation mm. he says what what happens if having stripped away everything else the cent centuries of power and entitlement what's left is rotten or hollow <laughs> and how do you go about filling it with the right stuff Gosh, I thought I was Eeyore. <laughs> um, well, I, I have faith enough to believe that at the core it isn't rotten because at the core is Jesus Christ. So I, as long as the community is drawing its life from Christ, the core won't be rotten. Um, however the embellishments and all that we do the the sort of um the things we do in christ's name can be pretty awful um and i think a lot of the things that we've taken for granted as being part of the christian faith are not they're just cultural accoutrement that uh, or barnacles on the ship that we don't actually really need <clears throat> So distillation is very important, it seems to me, and discernment. Uh, but I, I suppose I'm a person who believes that as long as we keep our eyes firmly fixed on the centre of the Christian faith, which is God, 
being made known in Jesus Christ, then I don't believe you'll ever find true rottenness at its core. You'll find a source of great peace and, and transformation. I do believe that. I'm going to tie two questions up together because it's often good to kind of just fi find um, questions that kind of theme together. Um, uh, one, you, I don't know whether you want to comment on this, but w one of them is, um, is, you know, are we getting the best inspirational leaders for the church to be as you would like it to be, plausible, <laughs> attractive? And the, and the related question, well, you may think it's not, not related, is that the Church of England seems to be captivated by numerical success, 10,000 new house churches and so on, and yet Jesus' ministry arguably ended in abject failure. Twelve followers and even they abandoned him. So how do we, how do we define, as it were, success or what we ought to be doing in a way that's not numerical and financial? Mm. That's a really important question and it's one that shouldn't be lost because I think that's the question that we're going to be facing over the next years. Um, it is so tempting to think that it is all about growth and getting our PR right. Uh, I just can't help feeling that if we're selling ourselves like a hamburger, people are going to treat us like one. <laughs> and, and that actually we have to be about more. And that actually some of the ways we commend ourselves will not be corporate. And we won't be doing it in a language that the world necessarily recognizes as relevant what i hope always is that we we will be resonant to the deeper human need so i always say to preach preachers uh, who are training to be preachers you know don't be relevant be resonant speak to the deeper parts of each human being now for me it's going to be about discerning what what does resonate in human beings and then trying to show that you're a church that takes human beings seriously and that you're not scared to um, ask questions <laughs> and you shouldn't be scared either to say we we don't have all the answers because we're a community of faith not certainty um, and the two things are very different now this is not easily today um, a sellable, it seems to me. There's a, you know, we, we want quick clarity. We want strap lines. You know, when I, when I saw one bishop on his, on his paper saying, getting it bigger with Bishop Mike, I thought, oh Lord, you know, who's going to be <laughs> drawn by this sort of approach really? I, and that's why the evangelism of the rose for me is important you know if we can get a loving questioning community that values integrity and honesty and reverent worship that's um uh that in some ways does you know try to be honest and, and keep our integrity as human beings then i would hope people will always find that a draw i mean some won't of course they won't um, so I haven't got answers to this. I just have themes which I think are going to be really important over the next few years. And what I'm absolutely convinced about is if we simply feel that we can somehow succeed as a church because we're going to imitate Google or uh, John Lewis or Barclays, I, I think we've got it badly wrong. I, I think people want to get off the high street and hear a, a different voice. Um, I think the longing is very deep, but I'm afraid I don't think we, we've won the trust or plausibility at the moment to be listened to very seriously or for long, which slightly answers the question about leadership. Uh, I, I don't know how bishops, for instance, and the Church of England do it, if I'm honest. I... I think it must be incredibly difficult at the moment. Um, I just get a little bit fed up with the over compromises and cautionary uh, approach 
that some of our le leaders do have. I think now is the time, now is really the time to be heard and seen and, and to go for it. Um, and I'm always being told when I say this, bishops will always look at me knowingly and say things like, yes, but I am a symbol of unity. You know, I've got to hold it all together. And I keep saying it, but before that, you're a symbol of integrity. You know, um, and that's that's what I'd like to keep in the room a bit more. So, but again, I, I, I wouldn't want to be. I'm wearing purple today. I hope you realize this is about the nearest <laughs> I'm going to get to it. <laughs> <laughs> there's a couple of, I don't know if these questions belong together, but there's one question about, um, about young people who just perceive the Church of England as lukewarm. Um, and there's another question about, about joy and how, you know, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice and how, how that fits with the theme of the Lent. Mm. So, so, yes, I mean, how, yeah. Let me take the Some last one first, first yeah. and then you're going to have to remind me what the first one was, okay? Um, the second one about joy, I, I touched on it at the end, that the purpose of lament is not, is not just to go downhill, um, but actually to, to praise, is to, to restore a relationship of trust. So I always want to remind people that belief is not about, you know, loads of certainties that you sign on the dotted line. Belief is a lot more like trust. So it, it's a, when I when I get up in the creed and I say, you know, I believe in God. What I what I think I'm really saying is, it's a bit like your doctor. You know, I believe in my doctor. I trust my doctor. Um, so it's a, it's about a relationship of of trust. And one of the ways you have probably found in your lives that you can do that with someone you love is by daring to be honest and then work through it and that's the purpose of lament with god um that i do believe can lead to joy it's hard won sometimes it's not happiness i mean happiness is great if you can you know feel it but i don't think it's a permanent uh, and that awful word that's banding around wellness ugh, sounds like a town in norfolk you know uh, jesus did not offer us a massage he offered us a cross okay? so we are a little bit more than you know feel good factor religion i don't believe that i do think we're about um the search for true joy um and one of the things i uh, forgive me some of you may have heard me say this before, but I, I, I really believe this, that, you know, we've all been given a great gift and it's called our being. And we're asked to give one gift back in return for it. And it's called our becoming, who we become. And that means I need a religion. I need a faith that can spot my full stops, my hard little full stops in life and change them into commas. You know, make me bigger, expand me, make my heart larger, deeper, my mind more responsive, more attentive to, to the, you know, all those things I want my religion to prompt me into doing. And therefore, I want a religion that's a bit difficult. I don't want it all to be easy. I want it to challenge me. I need it. So um, joy, I think, is a process. Um, and I think it's one that if you have a faith that is doing all those things, it will it will help you understand that. What was the first question? Like I've forgotten. Well, Mark, I, I think I'm probably <laughs> going to suggest that we bring it to a close because there are more questions coming in. And all right. uh, mm -hmm. and, and I, I would like to stick with our 7.30 um, um, ending time. We've done 20 minutes of questions. Um, so I apologise to the people who have um, who have asked questions, but we haven't been able to to pose them. But we are going to move towards um, our final um, part of worship.